so our uh, uh, today's topic is on uh, scoliosis and for uh, when i was in those graduate student this was a very very difficult topic to understand and uh, probably my professor was doing a lot so we had to read a little bit so if you are in touch with this topic then uh, it is difficult it's not difficult to understand but if you are coming not coming across these cases uh, sometimes it's difficult to understand and grasp uh, the smaller intricacies of decision making in idiopathic scoliosis of course scoliosis is a very very broad term and to take the whole scoliosis as uh, a topic is going to be a very long topic but still uh, i am going to touch the major major chunk uh, which everyone may come across is the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis which is one of the most common uh, deformity in spine that is seen uh, in the community so coming to the basics of it uh what is uh, what is a uh, scoliosis okay so what is a scoliosis so if we just put it in a very clinical term then scoliosis is just the lateral curvature of the spine leading to body asymmetry okay you all know that spine when you look from the coronal plane or from the frontal angle usually the spine is straight but in scoliosis if you take it as a broader term there is a lateral deformity and you can see here that this deformity there is a lateral curvature of the spine so if you see this this is known as a uh, lateral curvature of the spine which leads to body asymmetry and you can see because of this curve there is lot of change which occurs into the ribs on one side on the other side and because of this curvature you can see that there is asymmetry of the shoulders there is asymmetry of the pelvis and i'll come to later on that there is a problem not only in the frontal plane but there is also a problem in the lateral plane as well as in axial plane where you get a rib harm and you get a uh, kyphosis and a lordosis in the spine so there is a change uh, in the whole body symmetry and that term is known as a scoliosis so that is a more or less clinical term where you get a curvature of the spine but you can get in so many different conditions this body asymmetry and therefore there are certain definitions or which are very important for uh, scoliosis the first and foremost thing is that if you have the degree of the curve you should have at least 10 degrees on standing upright radiograph if more than 10 degree of deviation is there from the midline then it comes into a definition of a scoliosis so if you see this x ray this is around 93 degree which is too high but still if it is only 10 degree then also we can consider as a scoliosis up to 10 degree it can be a normal variation so that is the first point that everyone needs to know that degree of curve has to be at least 10 degrees the two other important part uh, is that there should be a structural curve everyone knows hip very well right you have a fixed deformity and an attitude so if you have a deformity then it has to be a fixed one attitude means it is correctable similarly in spine if the curve is correctable it is known as non structural but if it is not correctable it is known as structural so what is a structural curve that means the curve magnitude is greater than 25 degrees so if you measure this cobs angle i'll come to this how to measure this cobs angle later but if you measure this cobs angle if it is more than 25 it comes into the category of a structural curve but that alone is not the definition it should not correct on bending films okay it should not correct on the bending films so if i correct this and if i say and take the x ray 
and ask the patient to a uh, same side bending this 93 degree comes to 53 degrees or 52 degrees then still it is more than 25 so this is also known as a structural because it is more than 25 degrees okay so these are smaller things which are very important which i will come uh, which will be there in the lecture also so curve magnitude has to be greater than 25 degrees it does not correct on bending and the most important part you should have the rotation of the vertebra so if you take this plane x-rays then what is the rotation of the vertebra when you see these pedicles when you see these pedicles if the pedicles are both the sides of the pedicles you can see equidistant from the spinous process then there is no rotation that is known as neutral vertebra but if you see that there is asymmetry of this pedicle like you can see this pedicle is full this is half seen this is full seen so there is some element of rotation so in scoliosis there is in structural curve there is a curve magnitude more than 25 degrees it does not correct on bending film and there is a rotation of the vertebra so these are the three important things to make a curve scoliosis curve a structural curve okay coming to the nomenclature so usually by definition if you have this curve and this is the right side then the convexity side is known as that side of scoliosis so if you see this this is a right scoliosis okay right scoliosis now because it is in the thoracic region this is known as right thoracic scoliosis right so everything is clear it has to be more than 10 degrees it has to be structural and it is on usually said on the side of the convexity so that is how it is uh, usually it is named uh, of a scoliosis coming to the next part as I said, you have to define between the structural curve and non-structural. I have given you what is a structural curve. Now, if you see this same X-ray, this X-ray, there is a curve which is there in the thoracic region, but there is a compensatory curve which is there in the lumbar region. To compensate for the center sacral line, there is a compensatory curve which is developing in the lumbar region and there is also a compensatory curve which is there in the upper thoracic part. Okay, so if you see this curve, this is 93 degree. You see this curve, this is 39 degrees. So whether this curve is from T11 to L5 is a structural or non-structural? How do you say it is structural? It is more than 90, it is more than 25 we say it's structural. So is it structural? So that is one criteria. There is a rotation also. So it is structural. So now you have to apply the third criteria that if you bend it to the same side, that means if you bend this film and take this, this comes to 10 degrees. And if this comes to 10 degrees, means it is less than 25. So this curve is non-structural and this curve is structural. Okay? So this is how so these are the compensatory curves which are developing to compensate for the structural curves. So these non, these compensatory curves are always non-structural. Okay, so by definition now you know what is a structural curve and what is a non-structural curve. These non-structural curves are also associated with this, some of the spinal diseases which are not scoliosis per se but there are different spinal pathologies which can produce a spinal deformity and they can be a non-structural ones. I'll come to that later in some of the examples. Okay, so if you see types of the curves that can be a non-structural which can be because of the posture or compensatory mechanisms. There can be transient curves which can be there in this prolapse where you get a sciatic list we call it as a list but it is also known as sciatic scoliosis there are certain inflammatory like in tuberculosis if you have the patient has got a one-sided uh, there is a severe inflammation and spasm on one side then this patient will bend on one side and you get a transient curve in the spine and that will be struck that will be a transient 
non structural curve okay and the structural curve i'll already uh, talked about so these are some of the example this is a patient of uh, hemangioma there is a small hemangioma which is there in this two but if you take the plain x ray you will see that there is the whole spinal curve but this is not a structural curve you can see there is no rotation there is just a lateral bending but there is no rotation and this is secondary to the hemangioma okay so this is not considered as a scoliosis or it is a non structural scoliosis by definition now this patient you can see the patient is bent on one side and you can see that this patient in one bent on one side and if you take a full film then also you can see that there is a curve but this is curve secondary to the disc prolapse that this patient had okay so these are some of the examples that you can see a deformity but don't think that all the deformities fall into the category of a structural scoliosis the primary thing is that you have to differentiate whether the curve is structural or whether the curve is non structural okay so this is the second part now as i said that the nomenclature of this curve is also dependent on the location of the deformity so if you see i have just put four different clinical pictures and this depends on the hump and the hump is because of the rotation of the spine the spine rotates on one side and that rotation of the spine will give you the hump so if this hump is in lumbar region it is known as a lumbar scoliosis if this is in the lumbar and the thoracic region both it is known as thoraco lumbar here there is nothing in the lumbar but there is a thoracic hump and therefore it is known as a thoracic scoliosis and this patient has got a very large hump right from upper thoracic going into the thoraco lumbar so it is a long thoracic hump so just by clinical examination you can find out where is the curve when there is a structural deformity because of the rotation of the curve so this is this is how it is also named as a thoracic scoliosis thoraco lumbar scoliosis or a lumbar scoliosis okay these are the primary three uh, three regions where you can get this deformity coming to the structural scoliosis now this structural scoliosis can be because of so many conditions i am not going to touch and it's impossible to touch but as i said idiopathic is one of the most common and the second most common is congenital and then you can have a neuromuscular scoliosis like in cerebral palsy melomeningocele or a post paralytic because of any conditions like even the patient has got a spastic uh, 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 maybe a hemiplegia or maybe a brain stroke they can also develop these deformities or it can be a polio which is uh, which is one of the may Well, well, one of the most common thing which was seen previously now the rates have decreased but that's a neuromuscular scoliosis or if there is a asymmetry of the muscle tension then it will develop into a either a neuro neurological problem or uh, because of the muscular you get a neuromuscular scoliosis there are certain syndromic associations because of tumor or trauma you can get this deformities but i'm not going to touch any of these things the big thing all together so i'm mostly going to concentrate on the idiopathic which is one of the most common uh, deformity coming to the idiopathic scoliosis what is idiopathic you all know that idiopathic is a term when you don't have any identifiable identifiable cause is known as an idiopathic uh, scoliosis okay now no identifiable cause means you have mri which is normal you don't have any spinal deformity you don't have any problem bony problem in the spine and you get this uh, deformity and this is divided into three uh, three classification and this is the most commonly used but now it has been changed so the most common it was used was infantile when you see a deformity from birth up to 3 years of age it is known as infantile if you see this deformity between 3 to 10 years of the age which is known as juvenile 
and if you have a deformity after 11 years or 10 years or in the pubertal growth spurt then it is known as adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and majority as i said that you will see these patients around in 80 to 90, 89 to 90% you will have an adolescent idiopathic scoliosis now this was dependent on when it was first seen, whether it was seen before three years or before 10 years or after 10 years. But this has another bearing also. And what is the other bearing? And this is how it all depends on the development of the lungs. Usually, whenever there is a deformity of the spine, there is also a compromise to the chest cavity. And if this chest cavity is compromised, then if it develops in early phase of the life, that is before eight years, you will have a pulmonary compromise or the alveoli will not develop up to the adult uh, period. Okay, so if this new classification is based on the development of the lungs, and if you have a deformity from birth to eight years, it will compromise the lung capacity and this is known as early onset and if you have more than eight years it will not compromise because the lung has fully developed all the alveoli have developed and this is known as the late onset but for everyone this is the classification that is still very much well prevalent everywhere so we will use this infantile juvenile and adolescent uh, deformity Coming to the next uh, scoliosis is a congenital one. Now congenital one means you know that there is a bony anomaly which are present at birth. If the patient comes with a deformity, x-ray shows that there is some bony abnormality, any type of abnormality, then it does not fall into the category of idiopathic, but it falls into the category of congenital scoliosis because usually this bony anomalies develop between four to six weeks of gestation okay so it is far too early in the birth or in the development of the fetus that is at the four to six weeks usually these deformities start developing the bony anomalies start developing so if you have a deformity between at birth it was not at birth it was actually at the four to six weeks of gestation uh, that these bony anomalies start developing and when this starts developing at four to six weeks of gestation so from six weeks onwards to the 36 weeks when the child child is born there is asymmetry in the growth which can lead to progressive deformity and even after birth till the child attains some maturity the growth still continues and this deformity becoming becomes more and more complex with addition of the number of vertebras inside which are the secondary curvatures into the primary curve which was there so this is a very complex deformity which turns a very uh, which is a very severe curve which can turn if you don't treat them early so congenital scoliosis has, has a totally different uh, a totally different uh, approach compared to the idiopathic ones and these are much more complex deformities uh, compared to the idiopathic ones the incidence though is very, very less. It is only about 0.5 to 1 per thousand where you get these congenital scoliosis. Okay, now coming to the further classification of the congenital scoliosis. It is winter divided into three parts. There are so many classifications, which is very easy for you to understand. So I've taken this classification. One is failure of formation. That means a part of the vertebra is not formed. It is known as failure of formation. The second is failure of segmentation. That means part of the vertebra, which usually the disc develops between the two vertebral body, it does not form. Right? And this is known as failure of segmentation. And there can be a mixed anomaly of either of the two or multiple anomalies. So these are the three common categories. I'll just give you some examples for this to make it more clear to you. So if you see, this is a defect of formation. That is failure of formation. If you see this, 
this diagram, you can see there is vertebra which is half formed. There is a vertebra on one side, there is no vertebra on this side. So this vertebral body is only half formed, which is known as unilateral complete failure of formation, which is known as a hemi vertebra. Okay. Now this hemi vertebra, you see this, there is a growth plate here, there is a growth plate here, and there is only growth plate here. So there are four growth plates on the convex side and only two growth plates on the concave side. So this is going to grow faster here because there are four growth plates here. And this is going to be having a slow growth rate because of only two growth plates. So if these are fully segmented. They are further divided into four types, but I'll just keep it as simple that these are known as hemivertebras. These hemivertebras, depending on the growth plates, they can be fully segmented they can be partially segmented. That means you can see that there is a hemi vertebra here, but this part is already fused to the upper vertebra. So this is, but this is not fused there. So there is an asymmetry of the growth which is still going to occur. This is known as partially segmented. And this is incarcerated. That means there is no growth plate. It is already fused. This part is fused, this part is fused, and you can get an incarcerated. There is no growth plate there. So this will not have a deformity at all. And this is a non-segmented, that means on one side it is fused here, so it is not going to progress. So these are the types of deformity which are there, but basically default of formation, there is a hemi vertebra. There is another deformity which is there in failure of formation, is a wedge vertebra, where you can see that there is asymmetry. On one side, this is not growing at the same rate as this. This is a partially formed whole vertebra, but it is a wedge type. So it is known as a wedge vertebra. Okay. I'll just give some of the example that how if you don't treat them early, it progresses. So you have to change your treatment strategy depending on how it is going to progress. So you need a serial x-rays to confirm that this is a progressive deformity because you never know that which growth plate is going to go at which rate. So you first need to find out the rate of growth. Okay, so this is at birth. You can see this is a child. This is the x-ray birth. And you can see that there was a hemi vertebra at this place. Okay, it is the D10. Probably this is a D10 hemi vertebra. And you see that nothing was done at three years. It progressed. You can see that this curve is progressed. And the same patient came at seven years to me. You can see that how it has progressed in seven years of age. So the treatment strategy depends and you need a serial x-rays in congenital deformities to mark the progression of the deformities. If the deformities progressed, then you have to intervene early. Okay. So this is how this is going to progress in any body. So this is just one of our example. Four year it was going up progressive and then you need to stop the progression just by doing a posterior hemivertebrectomy that means we excised one part and then we did a short fusion there in uh, so the intervention is dependent on the progress of the deformity it can be at early age also it's not that deformity you have to treat after the maturity which is a very wrong concept which is there in the community but still uh, you have to just go at a right time so that you can control the curve the second part is a failure of segmentation. So there is a defect of segmentation. You can see that this is a whole block of vertebra. One, two, three, four vertebras. There is no segmentation by the disc. And this is known as failure of segmentation. One of the most common is block vertebra. Block vertebra usually don't have any progression or they, they don't produce much of a deformity. But if you have a unilateral unsegmentation, see this segmentation is not there on this side and there is a full segmentation on one side so you have see one two three four five six growth plates here and no growth plate or no growth occurring here so this is going to progress much much faster compared to a hemi vertebra because you have a six growth plates on one side no growth plate on this side so it's going to progress much much faster Compared to this, you have a 
another condition which is a mixed anomaly actually this is a mixed anomaly there is a hemi vertebra here and there is a and there is a unilateral unsegmented bar so this is going to progress much much faster okay so compared to failure of formation if you have a failure of segmentation like unilateral bar or unilateral bar combined with a hemi vertebra it is going to progress much faster i'll show you one of the examples this is a patient who had a unsegmented bar in mid thoracic region this is at birth you can see there is rib anomalies also so usually you have a rib anomalies also along in congenital scoliosis you can see how it is progressed at birth this is at 1.5 years this is at 3 years of age this is at 7 years of age and this is when the patient presented to us till at 14 years of age you can see how severe and fast his curves are progressing so this curve could have been controlled if the patient had come between 3 to 7 years of age but you know that uh, usually either because of the patient or because of uh, that you should not treat the spine early a deformity early this patient was 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 sent to us at 14 years of age so this shows that this is a fast progressing deformity okay coming back to our main topic i'm not going to come to congenital ones now because that's a different topic the treatment is different the whole uh, whole spectrum of disease is totally different compared to the adolescent so i'll now stick on to the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis so as i said adolescent idiopathic it starts at the puberty or near the onset of the puberty there is no cause cause which can be established and it's a structural lateral curvature of the spine now whenever you see this deformity is it a frontal plane deformity as i said no it's not only a frontal plane deformity this deformity is actually a three dimensional deformity what you can see on ap x ray and a lateral x ray is only a projection you have to think three dimensionally on ap and lateral x rays to get it actually it is only a single deformity like any deformity in the lower limb if you see you know that in elisarov also that you have to find out the plane of the deformity similarly here also there is a one plane of deformity it is not in ap it is not in lateral it is in the third plane because uh, it is a three dimensional deformity so there is a torsion of one vertebra over the another over 6 to 8 vertebral segments and that is reflected on ap and lateral x ray if you see this uh, if you see this uh, ct scan and you can see that this is lateral but these are so distorted distorted over this many segment that this becomes ap and again there is a torsion of this vertebra and again this becomes a cervical as a lateral okay so there is no deformity in one plane there is a torsion of each vertebra over other and you can get the deformity so it actually there is a torsion of the whole single vertebra which is there along with the nerves and the spinal cord okay so it's a three dimensional deformity it is not only a single plane deformity so if you take an ap x ray you will see that there is a lateral curvature and you can see the vertebral rotation because of pedicles which as i say if you take the lateral x ray you can see the sagittal plane whether there is a hypokyphosis or whether it is a increased lordosis or whether there is a uh, increased kyphosis in the thoracic region okay so ap and lateral x rays will give you some idea but you have to think three dimensionally where each and every vertebra is rotating coming to the prevalence of ais ais uh, is one of the most common but if you have larger degree of curve the prevalence depends on the degree if you have a less than 10 degree the prevalence rate is less but if you have a higher degree of curve then the prevalence decreases which is very common you cannot see a severe deformity much common you have a smaller deformities which are much common and as the degree of hops angle increases the female ratio increases if you see less than then it is male to female ratio then females are more compared to male but if you see higher degrees it is more common in female so as far as age is concerned a uh, female is more common compared to male and higher are much more common or less prevalent in if there is a higher degree of 
Wow, wow. Etiology. Uh, okay. So coming to the uh, etiology, exact etiology of idiopathic is not known. There are many factors which interplay and it's difficult in deciding which is primary and which is secondary. But there are so many contributors, I would not confuse you to go into these things. There are genetic, there is a melatonin secretion problem, there is a platelet dysfunction and calvinulin, which is, uh, which is a problem. There can be a neurologic problem, growth abnormalities, skeletal muscle abnormalities, connective tissue disorders, and biomechanical affection. Once the deformity starts, it automatically increases. So there are so many contributing factors. I'm not going to confuse you for these uh, uh, etiology. I'll just move forward. Now the biggest problem is what is the natural history? So if you have a deformity, how it is going to progress in the future? Whether it's going to give any problem to the patient? What happens if we don't treat the curve? And why we need to treat this uh, deformity? Is it only a cosmetic problem or it can give rise to a functional disability? I think this is one of the major questions that the patients are asking us, whether it is going to do any functional disability to the patient or not. And there is an assumption that scoliosis can lead to pain, there can be a decreased pulmonary function, and there can be psychological. These are the three things which are assumed that if you don't treat, then these are the three things which can occur. But let me tell you, that this is an article, very nicely written article, though it is in 2003, but it's a 50 year natural history study by uh, Weinstein et al. 50 years they have studied this uh, child and they followed it for about 50 years. And what did they study? They studied about the back pain, what is the mortality rate, what is the pulmonary compromise, what is the psychological issues that they can have, and how the curve progresses at which region of the spine. It's a very nice article, but they say that back pain, the incidence is similar to the control group. There is no much of a difference of back pain, whether the patient is having a deformity or no deformity, the incidence of back pain, the frequency of the back pain, they are more or less uh, similar, maybe slightly higher frequency, but otherwise they are more or less similar. If you have a thoracolumbar or a lumbar curve, like if you have a curve in the lumbar spine, then you will have a greater back pain compared to the thoracic curve. Okay, so if you want to see that which curve is going to give you back pain much more, definitely these lumbar curves which are mobile can give much faster degeneration of the disc and faster degeneration of the facet joints and you require, the patient will have a back pain in a thoracolumbar or lumbar curves. But only 1% will require surgery. The pain is not that severe that you require to intervene. So natural history of the idiopathic scoliosis does not include any functional disability of pain. Okay, so pain is not the criteria where you need to do intervention. The patient says that I have a back pain, you treat my deformity. No, that is not the criteria. Okay, coming to the second part, pulmonary compromise. Pulmonary compromise only occurs obviously in the thoracic curve because the thorax is affected, the compromise can be there in the lungs. And it is related to the magnitude of the curve. So if you have a higher magnitude of the curve, and definitely if it is more than 90 or 100 degree, you will definitely get a pulmonary compromise. And it is associated with not only the frontal plane degree of 100 degrees, but if it is associated with thoracic hypokyphosis, that means there is no kyphosis which is there, then the lung is compromised. And lung between the chest wall and the spine the lung is actually compressed and you get a lot of pulmonary compromise in thoracic, severe and hypokyphotic curves. Psychological problems, I think this is one of the most common, most common uh, reason why the patient comes to us and these patients, because they are in the adolescent age group, they are unhappy with the rib hum, the severe rotation and they have that peer pressure them and they go to school, everyone tells them that you are having a deformity and they cannot accept that. But if once they pass this adolescent period and they come into the adulthood and, mid and middle age, then these psychological problems go away. Psychological problems, that's why it's very important that they have psychological problems early in their life, that is in the adolescent group. But once they come 
and if the patient says at 30 35 that i want to correct the deformity there is no point uh, doing a correction of the deformity at this stage so natural history of the ais is good the major concern to the patient is actually cosmosis and it does not produce any functional disability unless it is severe okay so that's about the natural history it's good so if you don't treat the scoliosis there is no problem okay patient has only a cosmetic otherwise rest of the patient does not have any functional disability or it does not increase the mortality okay so that's very very important thing that you should know it's not that it is always it always require a surgery the other most important part is prediction of the curve progression supposing you see a patient of uh, deformity you have to predict that this curve is going to progress or it's going to remain the same so which curves are progressing it's very important to find out that which curves are going to progress and which curves are going to remain stationary or their growth rate is very less and this risk of progression depends on two factors the first important thing is curve related so what type of curve and you have that risk of progression and the other important thing is the growth potential so these are the two very important thing that you should know whether they are curve related factors and there are growth potential so if you see these two x rays this is at 14 years and this is at 15 years so whenever the patient came to us with a deformity this was a curve and the patient presented at 15 years with this deformity so very very obvious that larger curve at detection greater is the progression okay if this is the curve and this is the curve this is going to this is going to definitely progress faster and this is a biomechanical bearing that if you see that if you have a weight at this and if this is the apex this is a long lever arm and this is going to progress further compared to this uh, this curve which is of a very less magnitude so this is going to progress definitely faster so larger curve at detection greater is the progression the second thing is thoracic and thoracic lumbar curves and double curves like this is a double curve this is going to go much faster this is a lumbar curve this is not going to progress fast compared to the double major curves so if you see thoracic and thoracic or double major they are going to much uh, progress faster compared to the lumbar curves so it, these are the curve related factors that you should know that if the patient comes with these type of the curve they are going to progress faster definitely females as i said the females have a higher risk of uh, progression compared to the males somehow we don't know exact reasons but the most important thing is the growth related factors we should know this growth related factors you know it's very very important in planning uh, of intervention in uh, idiopathic scoliosis what is the remaining growth potential if the patient has a curve at 16 degrees or the patient has got a 12 of uh, 16 years of age and the patient comes to at a 12 years age the 12 year patient has got a higher growth potential compared to the patient who comes at 16 years because it's going to reach the skeletal maturity early okay so it's very important that what is exactly the age or what is the remaining growth potential and there are so many parameters i'm going to touch each of them what is the chronological age whether the patient has reached menarche what is the recent grading when is the closure of the triradiate cartilage what are the tunnel staging what is the sanders grading and what is the elbow epiphyseal closure so these are the important uh, things that you should look when the patient of deformity or idiopathic deformity comes to you so a skeletal maturity and curve progression if you see that curves progress more with more growth potential as i said and curves progress faster during the growth spurt so it's very important to know what is the growth potential remaining and how much is the growth spurt which is remaining okay now if you see growth spurt you all know that infants have a rapid growth spurt juvenile between 3 to 10 have a slow phase of growth and again in adolescent it's a rapid phase and as the patient matures again it is a slow phase so adolescent and infantile are going to grow faster compared to juvenile and mature but there is one more point in adolescent also 
though it is considered as rapid, it is again divided into a rapid phase, moderate phase, and a slow phase. So there are three phases which are found in adolescent also. Some crows grow faster, some crows doesn't grow faster. Depends on that whether it's a rapidly progressive or a slowly progressive crow. So chronological age. So age when first seen and magnitude of curve, younger the age, higher the chance of progression. Okay, it's very, very important that you should know that younger the age, higher the chance of progression. But chronological age is not important. It's important to find out the physiological age. And one of the important factor in physiological age is menarche. In females, the curves usually progress faster just before or I would say one to two years before the menarche. So you should ask the patient whether they have achieved menarche or not. If they have achieved menarche, that means you have already entered into the growth phase or it's already curve is growing faster. So it's a physiological age, which is very important. Some, some patients can have an early menarche. Some patients can have a late menarche. So it is all relevant to the menarchal age of the physiological age criteria. There's one more criteria, which is a pubertal growth factor because males cannot have. So you have to have a tenor staging depends on the development of the breast areola and the breast buds. So they have divided, the tanner has divided them into five stages. And if the patient is in the tanner stage two or three, there is a highest chance of progression. The only difficult part is to examine the patient's breast serially is difficult to assess in each patient. It is very, very subjective and you cannot actually uh, see each and every patient like that. So though this is a very important criteria, which is a tanner staging, it is not practical to use. So what are the other things that you should use to find out the physiological age? One of the important factor, which is very commonly now uh, uh, studied is the peak height velocity. It's very easy to measure. You have a serial height measurements done of the patient. Okay, if you have a serial height measurement done of the patient, then you find out the growth velocity expressed as centimeters per year. Okay. So if we have uh, increase, usually average value is eight centimeters per year in girls and 9.5 centimeters per year in boys in adolescent. Okay. So if you have the serial height measurements and if the patient has reached the peak height, that means at certain age, they will eat, reach the peak of their height velocity and then it will drop down. Okay. So reliable predicted cessation of the growth is 3.6 years after peak height velocity. So if the patient has reached the peak height velocity at around 12 years, then after 3.6 years, that means around 15 and a half or 16 years, the patient's growth is going to stop. Okay. So it's very important that when does the patient reach this peak height? So this is an important curve, which is there probably in your book also. But if you see this curve, this is the peak height. So this is the peak height where it is reached. And then it slowly comes down. But if you see these three lines are the curves of the adolescent growth spurt. Okay, this is the, this adolescent growth spurt exactly matches this peak height velocity. So from here, if there is a rapid, there can be moderate or there can be a slow phase. So if you can find out this, it's very, very important. Okay. So now there are certain criteria when you can find out the peak height velocity. So 83% of the curves, the little had done a study. What is the importance of peak height velocity? If at peak height velocity, if the patient has got 30 degree, 83% will progress. But if it is less than 30, only 4% pro curves will progress. So it's very important to find out what is the peak height, at what age the patient has reached the peak height. Unfortunately, peak height is a retrospective finding and it cannot be used clinically, but it's a very important factor. And what are the factors? which are very important to find out whether you are before or after the peak height. 
One is a reserve grading according to the radiological criteria. This is one of the most important criteria that we are using very day in and day out. When you see the fusion of the iliac ap apophysis, the iliac apophysis is divided into four parts and it starts fusing. And if it is not fused, it is known as grade zero. But if it starts fusing, and you divide it into four parts, it is reserve one, reserve two, if it is half, if it is three fourth, it is reserve four, it is complete, it is reserve five. That's how it is a reserve grading, which is very important. If it is reserve zero, that means the full growth potential is still remaining. Though it is not accurate, I'll show you later. It's not accurate, but it is one of the major factors that we find. The other important thing that you find out is the tri-radiate cartilage closure. Usually it is 12 years in females and 14 years in male that this tri-radiate cartilage closes. Okay, so if this is closed, usually it is around 14 years or 12 years in female. But this also does not correspond with the peak height velocity. But this is one of the criteria which is better compared to the research, compared to the research grading, where you have a tri-radiate cartilage closure that you need to see. These are two very important criteria. Out of these two, the phalangeal epiphyseal closure, who much more accurate, it is slightly difficult. But most important thing I feel, which is which can clinically used is the olecranon epiphyseal closure. We have seen five different types of epiphyseal which are there of, uh, at the elbow. And one is the olecranon. And if this is closed, once you find that this is closed, it corresponds to the peak height velocity. If you see this graph, this is the acceleration phase of the peak height and the elbow closure exactly matches the peak height velocity. So if you have, if you have reached this place, then you know that this curve can grow faster. So it's very important to find out the elbow fusion. So it was quite complex, but it's very important criteria to find out whether it's a reserve rate, whether there's open triradiate cartilage, what is the uh, elbow closure, okay, or electron uh, epiphyseal closure. Okay, these are very important thing that will give you uh, some idea that how this curve is going to progress by remaining growth potential. Okay, so after this is done, what are the things clinically that you are going to evaluate uh, in patient of osteoporosis? Definitely, as I said, that you should find out what is the chronological age, what is physiological age, or secondary sexual characters, whether the patient has reached menarche or not. And as far as the cosmetic deformity is concerned, what you have to look for basically is the shoulder balance, pelvic balance, where is the rib hump, and what are the lumbar curves. You can see that there is a furrow which is there in the lumbar spine. So this gives a bad cosmetic appearance. And the most important the patient is coming is the rib hump. And you have to find out how much is the rib hump. There are methods to find out this rib hump. One of the clinical methods to find out the rib hump, whether it is there or not, is the Adams test. Everyone should know what is an Adams test. To ask the patient to stand with the folded hand and ask him to bend with this folded hand up to the knees. And you can see that this rib hump becomes much more prominent. So these are the things that you should look at it. But more so, you have to look at the skin stigma. If you see the skin of the spine, if you find out any of the stigmata, like you can have uh, hairy patches, you can have a nevus, you can have a dermal sinus. If anything is present, that indicates that this patient is having some congenital problem inside. Okay? So it's very important to find out this skin stigma. It's very important to have a subtle neurological examination. Of course, you have a gross lower limb examination for neurology. But most important thing, if you have an abdominal reflexes which are absent, it indicates that it's a congenital. Okay, it's not an idiopathic stimulus. You have, you should find out what is the flexibility of the curve. This is very important. Planning of the treatment. What is the ligamentous laxity? Ligamentous laxity. Marfan's patients do develop this ligamentous laxity and they do develop a deformity. Parfums uh, will give rise to a deformity also. 
you can have a lower limb evaluation which is very important because shortening either it can be apparent shortening because of the spinal deformity or there can be some true shortening which can give rise to secondary scoliosis so it's very important to see the limb length you should find out whether there is a foot asymmetry or a wasting because that indicates that there is some intraspinal anomaly which is there you have to look at the face and the palate which in syndromic patients you have a high arch palate you have a blue eyes in osteogenesis imperfecta so you have to see this face you have to see these palates so these are very important things that you should look for clinical deformity i have already told about this so i'm just going to skip but these are some of the examples you can see that there is a nevus which is there this is a patient of a congenital scoliosis you have a cuffing spots which is there in neurofibromatosis so you have a hairy patch one of the patient having a diastomatomyelia and you can see there is a dermal sinus with a spinal dysrhythm and you have a this is a patient of marfan's having a deformity and you can see that this is a ligamentous laxity is one of the signs for the marfan syndrome okay so these are the clinical things that you should look for now there are certain red flags on clinical examination these are very important once you see this you should find out that this is not at all an idiopathic scoliosis if you find a skin stigmata it is not idiopathic if you see that there is a pain the patient comes for a pain it is not idiopathic scoliosis if there is a stiffness it is not idiopathic scoliosis if you have abdominal reflex which are absent it is not idiopathic scoliosis and you have a atypical curve one of the most important factor for a atypical curve if you have a left thoracic it can never be never be an uh, idiopathic scoliosis so if you have any of these things it's a criteria that you should have an mri imaging okay so of course mri imaging is done in all patients but more so if you have any of these red flags you must 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 get an mri of these patients okay so as i said uh, scoliosis you should have x rays for a scoliosis profile what is a scoliosis profile you should have a full length ap you should have a full length lateral these are two very important x rays because it is not only this part which is curved you have to find out what is the compensatory curve which is developing down what is the compensatory curve which is developing up you need to find out the central sacral line which goes from the s1 and you should find out whether it is a balanced or unbalanced curve so it's very important that you should have full length curves the important part is you should have both the side bendings also how much it is correctable and to assess the curve flexibility you should have these bending films also there are certain radiographic measurements which i am coming to it later but the most important thing you should find out the corps angle into ap and lateral what is the corps angle ap and lateral you should find out what is apical translation so if you draw this line central sacral line and you will find out the distance of this apex of the curve to this this is known as apical translation the other important thing is the truncal shift if you this if you if you draw this line and extrapolate up then this is not in the center if t1 is not matching the s1 t1 is not matching the s1 you can see that the whole upper body is shifted to right side okay this whole upper body is shifted to right side so that indicates that there is a truncal shift okay so the you have to have a corps angle in ap and lateral you should know how much is the truncal shift you should know how much is the apical shift so these are the terms which comes off and on uh, when you read this so truncal shift truncal balance is very important as i said that this is a congenital scoliosis is a diastomatomyelia but you can see that because of the rotation one lung is totally and there is a hypolordosis hypokyphosis one lung is totally totally compressed compared to the other one okay it's very important to get these things uh, to find out not only the intraspinal anomalies but it can give you idea of how much is the lung compromised okay so there are certain measurements that you do of the uh, spinal curvatures and cobb's method is one of the method that we usually use what is a cobb's method how to measure the cobb's angle 
So you choose the most tilted vertebra above and below the apex. So if you go from the apex and if you come down, which is the most tilted vertebra? This is the most tilted vertebra. If you go above, this is the most tilted vertebra. Okay. So the angle between the most tilted vertebra above and below the apex and you draw a line perpendicular to this line it gives you the corpse angle okay this is very very important uh, to measure in each and every patient because this angle you have to measure it serially to find out how much the curve is progressing okay coming to different terminologies as i said there can be a main curve which is known as either a major curve or a primary curve or there can be a compensatory curve like if this is the curve this is known as the main curve and the upper curve and the lower curve are all compensatory curve so if this is the curve this is a major curve or a primary curve while the upper curve and the lower curve they are the compensatory curve okay so if you have a balanced curve then this should match the upper and the lower compensatory curve but they are known as a minor or secondary curve you should know what is the main curve, what is the compensatory curve. Coming to coronal balance, as I say that if you draw a central sacral vertical line, if it passes through T1, it is known as a balanced or a compensated curve where the trunk is absolutely lined over the pelvis. So this is known as a coronal balance. But if you see here, the trunk is shifted to one side. So this is known as uncompensated or decompensated curve where the compensatory curves are not compensating to the primary curve. Okay, so this is why it is known as a decompensated curve or a compensated curve. Compensated curve are a balanced curve and actually what our goal is to have a balanced spine. Okay. So clinically, if you draw uh, if you draw a line from T1, it goes through the natal fold. So this is a compensated, the same patient, and this is a decompensated. Okay, you can see that it is going on one side. So that's how you can find out clinically whether it's a compensated or a decompensated spine. Sagittal balance is one of the major, major important finds. You have to have a C7 to T1 line, C7 to S1 line and c7 to s1 line should fall at the posterior inferior corner of the uh, sacrum okay this is where it should fall if it goes much more in front it is known as a positive balance if it goes behind it is known as a negative balance so sagittal balance you have to have that full length x-ray and try to draw this sagittal balance so you can see this patient Again, the same patient, you draw this line, it is quite decompensated in sagittal plane. There's a lot of decompensation. Sacrum is somewhere here and this is gone in front. That's known as sagittal decompensation. Coming to the definitions, I think this is very important. Uh, end vertebra, neutral vertebra, apical vertebra, stable vertebra. These are very, very important thing to find out and I, I see that everyone fumbles when they are asked what is end vertebra neutral vertebra they are not that difficult it's very very uh, simple thing to know what is an end vertebra the most tilted vertebra in the curve is the end vertebra the disc spaces become parallel so if you see this this disc space becomes parallel okay if you see this they are all wedged but if you see this this is the most tilted and the disc becomes parallel this is a lower end vertebra of this curve okay what is a neutral vertebra as i said that there is a neutral rotation of the pedicles and pedicles are seen equally okay so this t11 is the end vertebra what is the apical vertebra the most horizontal vertebra that you see in the curve is known as the apical vertebra so this is the apical vertebra okay it's the most horizontal okay so end vertebras are most tilted while the apical vertebras are most horizontal, right? Uh, what is a stable vertebra? Now, if you draw a center sacral line, which goes uh, from S1 to T1, the 
vertebra which is bisected by this central sacral line is known as the stable vertebra this is very important to find out the fusion up to what level you should extend the fusion it is more or less confirmed that you should, if you want that your curves should remain stable for a long time then you should have a fusion up to the stable vertebra okay so the uppermost vertebra which is most bisected by the central sacral line in lumbar spine is known as the stable vertebra okay it's very very important now sometimes these all these three can be different like end vertebra neutral vertebra and stable vertebra are different or sometimes they can be the same you see this is the end vertebra this is the neutral vertebra and this is the stable vertebra they can be different so it's not always that all the three are same sometimes it can be same also but it's not always that that's why it's very important to find out which is the end vertebra neutral vertebra and stable because you have to go for the fusion below the neutral vertebra below the end vertebra and up to the stable vertebra so therefore it's very important to find out which are the these three uh, uh, vertebras okay so this is just an example if you see this curve d4 is most tilted d11 is most tilted this is most horizontal so this d11 d11 is the end vertebra that was also the neutral vertebra but you can see this l2 is a stable vertebra okay l2 is a stable vertebra so that's how you should plan uh, what is a stable neutral end vertebra and apical vertebra these are very very important coming to the classification of idiopathic which is one of the most common classification is the lanky classification because it has importance not only given to the coronal plane deformity but it has given importance to the sagittal profile also okay uh, and they have divided i am not going to go in detail of this classification but they have divided into main thoracic double thoracic double major triple major thoracolumbar lumbar and thoracolumbar lumbar uh, uh main thoracic okay so these are the six but they are actually 42 so once you know where is the curve they have given main thoracic is 1 2 3 4 5 6 so there are six types which are there divided in in coronal plane these are the different uh, patterns i am not going to go in detail you have to read about it but once you have this coronal plane you have to have this lumbar modifiers and then you have to have this sagittal modifiers and you will get this lanky classic so it's very complex everyone needs to uh, learn by heart okay so coming to the treatment of the idiopathic the last part it can be either observation it can be bracing or it can be surgical these are the three treatments that once you do to the patient observation if the, if you have a curve which is less than 25 degree no need to do bracing just need to observe just need to observe if the curve is less than 25 so from 10 degrees to 25 degree just need to observe the patient even bracing is not required usually the bracing starts from 25 degrees of the curve to 40 degrees of the curve okay and above 40 this is a gross guideline that i am giving and above 40 degree of curve you may consider the surgical treatment there are so many factors but these are 10 to 25 degree observation 25 to 40 degrees bracing and more than 40 degrees surgical okay so as i said bracing is between 25 to 40 degrees and what type of brace the brace has to be worn about 22 hours per day then only it has a uh, uh, very much importance but the main problem is the compliance because everyone cannot wear actually in our setup which is a hot climate If everyone cannot wear the brace for 22 hours, so there are part-time bracing which are done, like not not night-time bracing or not in schools and all these strategies. But the best is 22 hours. But minimum that you have to wear is for about 16 to 18 hours. And if you wear these braces, there is a 74% success rate at halting the curve progression, which is too good. So if you have a patient who comes to you early, you can actually actually uh, halt the curve progression and patient can avoid surgery okay it's very very important so uh, that's the brace treatment 
So coming to the surgical treatment, the last part, the curves greater than 40 degrees in thoracic and in thoracolumbar, you can wait up to 50 degrees. Okay. So the thoracic, why early? Because they will give much more cosmetic problem compared to thoracolumbar and lumbar curves. That is one reason. And the other reason is if you fuse a lumbar spine, you are losing the movement of the lumbar spine. And therefore, it is always better to wait a little bit more in lumbar curves compared to the thoracic curve. Thoracic curves gives much more cosmetic deformity. They become much more rigid faster. So they need to be treated earlier. While thoracolumbar curves, they don't progress that much fast. They don't give that much of a deformity. And the most important thing is you must have a lumbar spine movement. It is very important for that patient throughout the whole life. If you fuse these lumbar curves early, you are losing the movement. And these patients may in later date come with a degeneration in the lower lumbar spine at L4, 5 and L5, S1. Okay, so what are the principles of operative treatment? The principle of the operative, the first and the foremost principle is fusion of the progressive curve in possible biomechanically correct alignment in all three planes. So you should have a biomechanically correct coronal, sagittal and axial plane. If you have this thing and the progression is stopped, so prevention of the progression is very important. But this has changed nowadays because of a very good instrumentations. Our, our whole focus has changed from prevention of progression to a correction of a deformity and improving the cosmetics. Okay. So this was the era before 10 or 15 years, I would say this was the era where you just fuse the spine in a biomechanically correct alignment to prevent the progression. But nowadays, the whole concept has changed. It has come to correction of a deformity with cosmesis. But for this cosmesis and correction of deformity, what is important? The trunk should be centered over the pelvis and shoulder and pelvis should be at the level. If you can provide this thing, the cosmetically the patient will be much, much happier. So you don't need to overcorrect all the curves, but you should have a balanced spine and that should be the goal rather than a complete correction of a deform. Okay. So this is a principle of an operative treatment. Now there are so many ways that you can do. And what are the principles of the fusion? It's a very critical decision. You should have adequate levels of the fusion. If you fuse more in lumbar spine, the patient will come with lumbar disc degeneration and back pain. If you fuse less levels, you have an add-on phenomena and the curve is going to progress. Okay, so you should have find out the adequate levels. And this is one of the patients. It's a coronal, coronal decompensation. This is what you have seen already before. This is sagittal decompensation. You can see this was a 109 degree curve. This was an 80 degree curve in the lumbar region, 109 degree in the thoracic region. But if you correct it to 50 degree there, 50 degree there, it's more or less a balanced spine. You can see the pelvis is balanced. The shoulder is balanced and the trunk is sitting over the pelvis and it's balanced spine. We don't need to correct this by 100%. Okay. What you require is balanced spine where the trunk sits over the pelvis. The pelvis has to be straight and the shoulder has to be aligned. Okay. So pelvis is level, shoulder is level, T1 is over S1, that means trunk is over the pelvis and it's a balanced curve between the thoracic and the lumbar region. It's very important that you have a balanced spine rather than a full correction. Okay, the same patient in sagittal, uh, you can see it is sagittal plane is also corrected and center of gravity is nearly normal. Okay, and that's the clinical, you can see that shoulder is level, the hump is gone and you can have this uh, good correction of T1 to S1 line also. Okay, so it's very important to have a good selection of the fusion levels. The most important thing that we use for selection of the 
I, there are three concepts of Harrington, Mo, and King. I'm not going to that detail, but this is what I use. How to choose the upper end selection, how to choose the lower end selection. Upper end, you have to go up to neutrally rotated vertebra. The disc has to be parallel. Opening of the disc space equally in both bending and the shoulder should be level. That's where you should select the upper end. Lower end also same. You should have a neutrally rotated vertebra. You have a parallel disc space. Opening of the disc space equally in both the bendings. You should go up to the stable vertebra as I said before. And lumbar modifiers A and B. I have not touched this part. But you should go up to the stable vertebra. Okay. So since then this is in the coronal plane planning. But if in sagittal plane in lateral x-ray. Two important very important things. Never end at the apex of the sagittal curve. That means T6 in the thorax is the apex of that kyphosis. You should never stop at T6. And never end at the junctional area. That means T12L1 is the junction. You should never stop your instrumentation at T12 or L1. You can go up to L1, but you should never stop at T12. Okay, it can be, you have to just bypass the junctional area. So these are some of the principles that you should find out. The instrumentations that we use, initially it was Harrington rod, which is known as the first generation of correction of instrumentation. Then came the second generation. I don't think that you will ever see the Harrington rod or Luke and Drummond sublaminar wires in your, uh, your lifetime now, because they have already passed, you have already passed uh, through these two generations. You will also not see the hooks. As I see that the fellows coming to me, they have never even seen these multiple hooks which are there. Most of the corrections now are done are pedicle screw based correction. They are the third generation uh, instrumentation. And you can do the same spinal correction by anterior spinal instrumentation, which can be either a single rod or double rod. I'll give you examples, don't worry about it. But the posterior spinal fusion with instrumentation is a gold standard. Majority of the thoracic curves can be treated by posterior spinal instrumentation and all double major curves are treated by posterior spinal fusion with instrumentation, which are pedicle screw based systems. Okay, that's the current gold standard. What you do, you expose the spine right from upper vertebra to the lower vertebra, you place the screw strategically you do a good soft tissue release what does that soft tissue release mean you have to release all the ligaments like interspinous ligaments you have to release the capsule of the facet joints uh, you have to release and you can do a facetectomies to remove the facets at all the levels that will give some uh, play then you insert the rod then you do correction maneuvers. There are three correction maneuvers like rod rotation, cantilever and combine. I'll come to that. And then you do a compression and distraction at strategic levels. And then you do a fusion and the whole time. So what is a rod rotation technique? One of the most commonly used technique in correction of scoliosis is rod rotation. What is rod rotation? So if you see, this is the spine, which is a bend. You put strategically the screws from upper end vertebra or upper selected fusion level to the lower selected fusion level. Now this is in a coronal plane. Okay. This is what the release as I said you do a facetectomy at each and every level. You see you have removed the facet. Once you remove the facet the spine will become mobile and it will increase your correction and decrease the uh, stress on the implants then you bend the rod with the help of the bend rod bender whatever sagittal plane you want if you want that a 40 degree kyphosis you want at the thoracic region you bend the rod to 40 degree kyphosis in this way which is according to your sagittal plane then you put this you insert this rod in a coronal plane. So this is a 40 degree sagittal plane, but you have placed the rod in a coronal plane. Okay. So it goes through all these screws and with the help of the vice grip, with the help of the vice grip, 
you hold it at both the ends and turn it 90 degree so this rod which is in coronal plane will turn into a sagittal plane and you will get that 40 degrees of sagittal kyphosis okay in thoracic region okay so this is known as rod rotation so you put the rod in coronal plane and rotate it 90 degrees in sagittal plane therefore this maneuver is known as rod rotation so once you rotate this it will become straight along with this the spine will be pulled and it will become straight so this is straight in coronal plane but in sagittal plane you will get that 40 degrees of kyphosis whatever remaining you can do a compression and distraction distraction on the concave side and compression on the convex side remember one thing that distraction produces kyphosis and compression produces lordosis so even in sagittal plane whatever you want compression or distraction depends on coronal as well as sagittal plane and alike so that's a uh, that's and then you apply the other rod on the other side and then you do a feeling. So that's how you do it. What does a cantilever mechanism do? Cantilever, you just put the rod wherever it comes and with the help of instrumentation, pull segmentally each vertebra towards this rod. Okay, so that's a cantilever mechanism. Usually we use either of the two or both in these uh, patients. So this is one of the curves. Is 48 degree quite flexible with a minimum instrumentation you can get a very good correction so another patient uh, 93 degrees you can see it's a quite severe curve with the help of pedicle screw instrumentation uh, you can get a very good cosmetic corrections okay so these are the two curves which are given the example what is the role of anterior spinal fusion it saves the motion segment anterior spinal fusion it saves the motion segment because you don't have to go up to the stable vertebra you have to just go from end vertebra to end vertebra it's very important to get this motion segment preservation in lumbar and thoracolumbar forms okay so anterior spinal fusion is very much useful if you want to preserve the motion segment okay so if this is the lumbar curve then if you want to preserve 4, 5 and 5, S1, if this is a stable, then you would definitely fuse up to L5 because L5 is the stable. Okay. But if you do an anterior spinal fusion, you can go up to the end vertebra, which is this, and you can save these two base segments, which are very important. So anterior surgery for lumbar and thoracolumbar curves to save the motion segment has definitely role as on today also. Okay. Uh, this is the last part where we actually do this anterior, anterior fixation and correction through thoracoscopy. This is actually a thoracoscopic instrumentation, uh, which can also be given, uh, which can also be cosmetically very, very helpful. Okay. Now, if these curves are severe and rigid, which is more than 75 degrees, then you have to use spinal osteotomies by posterior approach, which are known as posterior column osteotomies, like asymmetric pedicle subsection osteotomies or vertebral column resection. You have to resect the whole one vertebra into disc. Just remove it so that the whole spine becomes absolutely loose and you can realign the whole final column according to what you want. Just give you some of the examples. This is an 82 degree curve and you do an anterior release, you do a thoracoscopic anterior release and you can make the spine flexible and that's an 8 year follow up, a complete correction. And as I said, this is a very severe 140 degree. This is so severe a curve that you cannot correct with all these correction maneuvers. So what we did is an apical resection. We just removed this whole vertebra. So you can see this vertebra, this is the vertebra there and this is the vertebra, this is a flattened vertebra. We actually remove the whole vertebra and put a bone graft there. So once we remove this vertebra, you can make this spine totally loose and you can see how much good correction that you can get from 140 to this level. Okay, but these are very, very difficult, very complex surgeries, lot of bleeding and it is not a single surgeon's approach. 
it has to be a team approach. Okay, so don't try ever this thing unless you have a team approach. Okay, so this is known as a PSO or a vertical column resection. So in summary, uh, for idiopathic scoliosis, the etiology is unknown. The natural history is good except for cosmetic problem. If the patient has got a cosmetic problem, definitely go ahead. But if the patient comes for pain or functional disability, then I don't think that uh, this is going to help them. The curve should be monitored to prevent the progression. You should know what is the curve progression, what is the chronological age, what is the physiological age of the patient, and then how much it is going to progress. You try to find out the progression of the curve and treat it accordingly uh, at that particular age. So it's very important to find out this uh, research grading and collecton uh, uh, enclosure. You should do bracing if the patient comes too early and that bracing if the patient take, if the patient is counseled properly and they wear the brace properly can avoid a surgery. And therefore there is the importance of scoliosis screening where you pick them up early to avoid this uh, uh, long surgeries. Surgical treatment is definitely demanding. You can do the curves with greater than 40 to 50 degrees. Usually it is a segmental fixation is the treatment of choice and pedicle screw is the treatment of implant that is used for correction. And these patients should be followed up till maturity for problems even after surgery because there are so many uh, add-on phenomena, breakage, pseudoarthrosis. I have not taken all these complexities inside, but they are also a very important part of it. Uh, thank you very much. And I think uh, if everyone, if anybody has a question, I can definitely take the uh, questions. I have tried to cover more or less everything. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Anybody wants to ask a question, please proceed. Uh, JV Kishore, you wrote two questions in chat. Uh, do you want to ask any question? Uh, sir, that one only, sir. Like uh, whether we can yes. measure any uh, uh, sagittal imbalance in clinical method. Is, is there any yeah, yeah. method to... Yeah, definitely. You have that. Uh, uh, you can measure it by, you should know that the, the shoulder, the greater trochanter should be in the same line. Okay. So if you have either, uh, either if the patient is moving forwards, so if you have a mastoid process, shoulder and the greater trochanter, they should all three come in the same plane. If they are not coming in the same plane, then this is sagittally decompensated. You got my point? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, with that, we can tell clinically like uh, it is uh, not uh, uh, in exams, we cannot say. But uh, if it is required, we can say, sir. Like that. Yeah, yeah. You, have, you want to have three points. It has to be okay, mastoid sir. process, it has to be the shoulder, and it has to be the greater trochanter. They all should fall in the same line. If they okay. are not falling in the same line, then sagittally it is decompensated. Okay? Okay. Yes, sir. Right. sir, one more doubt, sir. Uh, yeah. uh, this is not related to only scoliosis, regarding uh, hip pathology also. Like, uh, uh, can I ask, sir? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sir, uh, in adduction deformity of hip, uh, the, actually the there is a curvature of uh, uh, scoliosis is towards the, no, not the scoliosis, sir. The uh, curvature of the spine is uh, more towards the, um, uh, in adduction deformity, it will be concavity towards the affected side, sir. And uh, in uh, abduction deformity, there will be convexity towards the affected side. Sir. Like, how do we explain that one? Like, uh, how, uh, how can we know that one? We are, we are not able to visualize that one, sir. Like, for hip deformity, you are telling? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, for hip deformity, if you have an adduction deformity, okay. So, then, yes, then the pelvis will be tilted towards? Yeah. If you try to uh, correct the adduction deformity, the pelvis will go move other way. So you will have a concavity yeah. towards toward, towards the adduction deformity side. Adduction. Okay, sir. Okay. Right. Okay. okay, sir. Thanks, sir. Okay. Yes, anybody else want to ask question?
anybody okay uh, so amit sir we can end uh, lecture here and uh, okay uh, on behalf of all the residents sir uh, thank you very much for your time and effort sir the lecture was in very detail and you make it very clear sir okay thank you very much thank you very good much night. sir good night good uh, night actually, sir actually uh, best of luck to everyone who is appearing for the exams from my side okay <laughs> yes thank you thank you okay. sir okay okay good night thank sir. you good sir. Night. Good, good night sir good night bachore sir good night amit sir